to become wise, it's listening to the soft, gentle voice of the Holy Spirit. The world has a way of uh, lying, to be frank, regardless of what society says. I have to test it to see if it's in line with what God's Word says. Um, and if it's not, then I reject it. And that's how I gain most of my wisdom. I believe wisdom is a collaboration of experiences that we go through on our journey as we're walking with Jesus. Experiences of hardship and joy, uh, times when God causes us to lean closer into Him and to trust Him. And through those experiences, we, we gain discernment uh, to navigate future experiences and also impart wisdom to others in the body of Christ. Well, good morning, Anchor. It is good to see you guys. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is John, and I'm uh, the executive pastor here at Anchor. And I'm so glad that you guys made your way here on a Sunday morning. Uh, I know that there are people in this room who are here for the very first time, or maybe even Easter was your first time, and I just want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, and we have something special for you. After the gathering in the crow's nest area, which is you go out these double doors and then hang a left and go down the kids' hallway, past all the fun kids' classrooms until you basically hit a wall, uh, there's another door there, and that takes you to the crow's nest area. There we are doing something called meet anchor. Uh, and Brian Halferty, who's our lead pastor, will be there. Susan Bautirsa, who's in charge of spiritual formation here, is our pastor there. Uh, they will be there and would love to answer any questions that you have about anchor. And again, that's for anyone who is new to anchor or even just feels new to anchor, even if you've been here for a while. We would love to see you there. Uh, if you've been here, if you were here last week, you know we're in a series called Becoming Wise, and we're going through the book of Proverbs and, and pulling out different sections. And so I get to, to kick us off in week two of that teaching series. In April of 2005, a journalist named Stephen Dubner and an economist named Stephen Levitt released a book called Freakonomics, A Rogue Economist Explores the Hidden Side of Everything. I, I love this book when it came out at the time. I think even though it's dated, a lot of the methodology and the questions that they were asking still holds up pretty well to this day. I also think that my brain is wired in a way that this type of book really does specifically appeal to me, where indiv these two individuals took data and statistics to examine either common perceptions that could be wrong or areas where information is hard to come by, and they use that data to present really interesting conclusions. Uh, now, there are some really flashy chapter titles that are designed to spark outrage and, and draw you in because we were still marketing that way back then, let alone now. Um, and, and the data is, is good and fascinating, even though there have been more recent studies that have come out. But I think that their approach is really cool, which is saying, what are some common misconceptions we might have? And what are some areas in which information is hard to come by and people need to know what does it mean to make a rational decision here? I think one of the most difficult areas for us to be wise in regards to are areas where information is hard to come by, where information is obscure or even opaque, right? An area where if you're looking through the glass, it's not very clear. In the early 2000s, the real estate market was one of those areas. Uh, the real estate market in the early 2000s was kind of the Wild West in a lot of ways, um, at least way more so than it is today. And as we saw a few years later when everything collapsed, um, that was probably wise, right? There was, it was a little bit too wild. But so much of the average consumer's decision-making in the early 2000s on real estate was based on what a real estate agent or a mortgage lender told them. And while there were definitely good real estate agents at the time and good lenders at the time, there were also those who took advantage of the lack of publicly available information about the real estate market. And again, we're, we're talking about a different time period, right? 2005 is not as recent as I would like it to be. Um, I was in high school then, and it feels weird that that's like 18 years ago, um, and that there are people who have graduated high school in that time span. Um, but it, it's a different time period. I know not all real estate agents are out to get as much money as possible no matter what. And since the explosion of real estate websites and, and publicly available information and easily accessible information since 2005, um, the market has kind of calmed down. There's also been some regulation that's helped with that as well. But that publicly available information has really helped calm down kind of that Wild West nature of it. 
And again, the market has become more ethical, but also like there are some really cool people. And I, I do need to do this disclaimer because we're going to pick on real estate agents a little bit. Um, I have a lot of really good friends who are real estate agents. And they are amazing people. <laughs> they are awesome. They love Jesus. Many of them call this church their home. They are ethical beyond reproach. And they are amazing. It, and I, I do recommend, like, if you're making a big real estate decision, talk to an expert. If you don't know any experts, any real estate agents or lenders, come find me after the gathering. I have, like, a list of five to ten real estate agents that I love who all call Anchor home. We'd love to help you out there. That being said... In the, two, in the early 2000s, especially in, in, in 2005, there was a lot of real estate agents who acted in their own best interest, not their client's best interest. Dubner and Levitt, who wrote that book, relay a story in it from a law professor at Stanford in 2001. He says this, I was just buy, about to buy a house on the Stanford campus, and the seller's agent kept telling me what a good deal I was getting because the market was about to zoom or take off. As soon as I signed the purchase contract, he asked me if I would need an agent to sell my previous Stanford home. I told him I would probably try to sell it without an agent, and he replied, John, that might work under normal conditions, but with the market tanking now, you really need the help of a broker. <laughs> Within five minutes, a zooming market had tanked. Such are the marvels that can be conjured by an agent in search of the next deal. So Levin and Dubner did a study on real estate agents in 2005, and they examined how does a real estate agent act when selling other people's homes, and how does a real estate agent act when selling their own home? And what they found is that real estate agents, when selling their own home compared to a client's home, kept their house on the market for an average of 10 days longer, hoping for a better offer. And as a result, their home sold, their own home sold for an average of more than 3% higher than their client homes. Why is that? Well, again, if we look at life through rational decision-making, 3% when you're selling someone else's home means about 150 bucks in commission. When it's your own home, it's about 10 grand. Right? So that makes a difference. What was more interesting to me, though, in this study was they took a look at advertisements or, or listing terms for real estate properties and researched which terms correlated to a higher sales price or a lower sales price. And so the 10 words that they researched were fantastic, granite, spacious, state-of-the-art, an exclamation point, uh, Korean, charming, maple, great neighborhood, and gourmet. Now, when I first read this book, knowing nothing about real estate as a high school student in 2005, I had no idea which words would mean a higher or a lower sales value. They all seemed good for the most part. The words that Yin used meant a higher sales price were these, granite, state-of-the-art, Corian, maple, and gourmet. It seems straightforward, right? It, they're descriptive. You can read these words and see something specific. Even something that seems classy, right? Like even if you're not a fan of granite or a state-of-the-art modern look, those words don't ever make you think of a fixer-upper. Or like someone is trying to fool you. They are specific and straightforward. On the other hand, the words that when used meant a lower aggregate sales price were fantastic spacious, exclamation points, charming, and great neighborhood. Dubner and Levitt in their book describe it this way, why these words were, were correlated to a lower sales price. Fantastic, meanwhile, is a dangerously ambiguous adjective, as is charming. Both these words seem to be real estate agent code for a house that doesn't have many specific attributes worth describing. <laughs> spacious homes, meanwhile, are often decrepit or impractical. Great neighborhood signals a buyer that, well, this house isn't very nice, but others nearby may be. <laughs> and an exclamation point in a real estate ad is bad news for sure, a bid to paper over real shortcomings with false enthusiasm. Isn't that interesting? Paper over shortcomings with false enthusiasm. And once you see that list on the screen laid out like that, where there's a list of 10 great sounding words or punctuations, and then data shows you, okay, this is good and this is bad, it makes it easier to make a wise decision, right? But what happens when we don't have that data? What happens when we're facing a, a moment where we don't have this, this research study that's then excellently written for, for lay people to understand? What happens when we make decisions in an area that seems opaque, that seems cloudy, that seems complicated? That's what we're going to talk about today in the second teaching of Becoming Wise. You see, in the book of Proverbs, which again is a, is a book of wise sayings and teachings uh, that we find in the Old Testament of the Bible, 
there's actually a section where we see two real estate agents selling their home, inviting people in to make a buying decision. Two real estate agents both giving a sales pitch, selling admission and ownership, a stake in this house, to either the house of folly or the house of wisdom. The house of folly or the house of wisdom. What's really interesting, and we'll dive into this today, is that the sales pitch sounds really similar for both of these houses but the reality is really, really different. So today we're gonna look at these houses of folly and wisdom and see how God has equipped us to make wise choices. So we're gonna first look at the house of wisdom. Okay, and and again, the house of wisdom, that's where where I wanna be, that's where you wanna be, that's where I want lots of rooms, that's where I want a large ownership stake, I want to reside in, I want to live in. We want wisdom, that's what this whole series is, is like how do we become wise? How do we take up residency in the house of wisdom as we live our life? And so in Proverbs chapter nine, verse one, we see the real estate agent for the house of wisdom selling this house. Wisdom has built her house, she has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants out of the house and she calls from the highest point of the city. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says. Uh, So verse four, let all who are simple come. To those who have no sense, we're coming back to that. The phrase comes back, we'll, we'll explain it a little bit. We'll come back to it. But she says this, and here is the sales pitch. Come, Eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. As we see later, this is going to be a a really similar sales pitch to the house of folly. But but there are some key differences. So here's some bullet points that we know about the house of wisdom from the sales pitch that we see from the real estate agent. The table is ready. The, the, the meat is prepared, the wine is mixed, the servants have been sent out of the house. It is ready for guests. It is ready for me and for you and the people passing by in the street to come on in and enter and take up residency in this house. She's calling from the highest place in the city. Let all who are simple come to my house. She calls to those who don't have sense. Here's what she says. Come, eat the food I made and drink the wine I mixed. And then in verse six, it says this. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. If you're underlining or highlighting stuff in your Bible, do that in verse six, right? Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. I think something that's really important to know in this sales pitch, because as we just heard in that study, words matter. This sales pitch from the real estate agent of the house of wisdom is filled with verbs. They are simple, straightforward verbs. They are actions that we can understand. Wisdom often works that way where it's simple to understand, but difficult to do and follow through on. But these are simple words and verbs that we can have a picture of the actions we should take, right? Come, drink, leave, walk. Just like the five words that correlated to a higher sales price in real estate ads, these verbs are specific and straightforward. And that's so important to remember today is that wisdom is specific and straightforward. Like it's not tricky, it is specific and straightforward. It's not easy, but it is simple. And as we read that, it reminds me of something that we once heard Jesus say to us, which is this, enter through the narrow gate. Small is the gate and narrow the path that leads to life. Jesus doesn't say the gate's hard to find. He says the path's hard to walk down. But he says it is right there. The path to wisdom, the path to life is laid out for you. Get on it and walk. Wisdom is often not complex. It is difficult to do, but simple to understand. It is difficult to have the discipline that wisdom takes, but it is simple to understand most of the time. So now we're gonna look at at a competing sales pitch, right? We're gonna look at at the house of folly. And again, the house of folly, the house of foolishness, the house of unwisdom, whatever we wanna call it, is, is where I find myself residing more often than I would like Right, especially if I look at, at younger versions of myself and even versions of myself this year, I end up taking up residency too often there. But we don't want to, right? This is where we don't want to be. So what are some characteristics of this sales pitch of the house of folly? We're gonna jump to the end of this passage and pick up in verse 13. It says this, folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says. So again, right, this is all very, very similar. 
Like we are seeing almost word for word exactly the same pitch, the same methodology, the same type of sales pitch that we had for the house of wisdom. But here's where it gets different. In verse 17, it says this, stolen water is sweet, food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there, that our guests are deep in the realm of the dead. So bullet points on this, right? Again, very similar. Door of her house, also calling from the highest point of the city, calls to everyone who passes by. Let all who are simple come to my house. Let those who have no sense hear this. When I read those passages, when I study these passages in Proverbs, it once again reminds me of something that Jesus said, where when Jesus was giving an instruction or a teaching, he would say, especially one that was powerful or hard to understand or something that he thought was important, Jesus would say this, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And I think this is the same thing, type of thing that we see in Proverbs where it's saying, all who are simple come to my house. Those who have no sense hear these words. And when I hear that, I think that applies to me. I think if you are not simple, if you have sense, you've probably picked one of these houses already. I think as someone who walks through life, this is to me. I think I am simple and I have no sense because I pick folly a lot. You might as well. And so when I read these words in Proverbs, I go, oh, that's for me. And I think we hear these sales pitches of wisdom and folly throughout our day. What's interesting, though, is she, she gets a little bit different here in the sales pitch where, where it says this, stolen water is sweet, food eaten in secret is delicious. Just like the real estate advertisement words that correlate to lower sales price, this pitch is full of flowery language used to paper over real shortcomings with false enthusiasm. Unlike the sales pitch for the House of Wisdom, there's no verbs here. There's no action steps. It's painting a picture. It's not telling you anything. It's painting a picture. It's sweet. It's delicious. These words that are meant to entice us but never direct us. Folly often sounds like this, where we are enticed towards something that isn't wise by a description that sounds too good to be true. That's what folly does is it papers over these shortcomings where like, this, is, this, this is the equivalent of a real estate ad going like, it's great, it's spacious, it's in a great neighborhood, please don't look at the bodies in the basement. Like it's great, it's cool, it's awesome. Because we see that, right, in Proverbs where it says like it is enticing, but there are dead people there. <laughs> and this is what foolishness does. It doesn't ever talk about that and you don't know it's there until you go in. And so that's the challenge for us is how do we tell the difference? Because again, just like that study, when we lay out the sales pitch here, when we lay out the sales pitch here, and we go, okay, these are clear, we can see the differences, and we have the author of Proverbs being like, by the way, here's your cheat sheet, there are bodies here, right? Like, we know the difference, but we don't get that in life, do we? Oftentimes in life, we don't get competing sales pitches of wisdom and folly side by side at houses at the highest point next to each other. But even when we do, they look the same from the outside, and they sound the same a lot of the time. I think this matters tremendously because we hear pitches for folly and wisdom countless times throughout our day. Countless times throughout your day, you will hear a sales pitch to make a foolish decision. You will hear a sales pitch to make a wise decision. So how do we know the difference? We're gonna spend the rest of our time together looking, saying, okay, what is a lens that we can use? What's a lens that we can put in front of our eyes and our ears as we are hearing these sales pitches to know when are we making a wise decision? How do we become wise? And so I think that there's a few questions that I ask myself and I want us to ask ourselves as we, make these questions, as we make these decisions. And the first question is this, do you fear the Lord? Do you fear the Lord? Something really cool about how this passage in Proverbs is structured, and you'll notice we jumped around a little bit, uh, the beginning and the end sound really similar, right? Almost word for word. And there's a little bit of tweaks, but almost word for word. Now, the author at the time wrote this in a way knowing that when he structured the passage that way, it would direct the reader's attention and focus to the middle section, that section that's different, that stands out. That's how they wrote in that time. And so the middle section, verses 9 and 10, is what I believe is the heart of this passage. Verse 9 says this, Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. We say we are all learning here for a reason, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Sounds familiar, right? Pastor Brian talked a lot about that last week. 
What about the next part though? Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So how do we gain fear of the Lord? How do we gain knowledge of the Holy One? I think there's a few simple things that we can do. Again, they're simple, but they're not easy. The first is this, is to spend time with God. Spend time with God. Fear of the Lord often comes from spending time with him and being in awe of his presence. And again, this is a healthy fear. And if you missed Brian's teaching on this last week, I'd really encourage you to go back and watch it on YouTube or listen to it wherever you get podcasts from because I think this is a really cool thing to go into depth on it. It grounds this whole series. But we have to spend time with God. There have been so many times in my life where I'm saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, why aren't you answering me? God, why aren't you answering me? And, and I wait and finally I hear a response where God says, John, where have you been? You only come to me when you need something. When you feel you finally reached a crisis point, where have you been for the last three weeks? I've been right here, John. We have to spend time with God. And again, it sounds simple, but it's not easy to do. It's so hard to prioritize that. I get that. I struggle with that. But fear of the Lord and knowledge of God can only be cultivated through spending time with him. So we need to pray. We need to listen when we pray. Prayer should be a conversation. And here's the thing, it doesn't feel like one, does it? Like it feels like I'm monologuing and then just getting nothing back, right? And my challenge to myself, my challenge to you is that even in the moments where prayer doesn't feel like a conversation, will you give it the space to be one? Would you allow yourself to have the space to not rush to the next thing, to not go like, man, there's no writing on the wall, there's no voice from above, like I guess God's quiet. Because I do that, like I frustrate. I'm like, God, if you really want to talk to me, you're God, can't you just talk to me? I don't know quite why God doesn't work that way, but I know he does it. I know he works in a, a wide range of other ways. And so I, I know when I allow time and space for God to respond to me and I say, God, I'm actually interested in spending time with you and listening to what you have to say, God reveals himself. And so would you allow that same time and space in your prayer life? I also think this right, knowledge of the Holy One. We should learn about God. We should be curious. We should study the Bible. I think it's awesome when people have doubts and, and, and struggles in their faith because it means that they care. I think oftentimes I analogize someone who doesn't doubt their faith with that like couple in high school who says they never fight. I'm like, does your relationship matter? Is it actually about anything important? Because I think if it's about something important, you'll fight and you'll grow from it. It's the same thing. I think if faith is important to you, you're gonna have doubts, you're gonna have questions. Will you do this? Instead of hitting that first wall of doubt and walking away, will you commit to saying, I'm gonna stay curious? I'm gonna stay curious and say, God, there's a problem with understanding here and I'm gonna trust that it's probably on me, not on you. That's why we're doing this Bible and whiteboard thing on Thursday night. I'm so excited for it because I think a lot of times we can look at these challenges of today, of 2023, that come with tech and social media and culture and all these things and go, man, the Bible was written so many years ago. Does it really talk to these things? And it does. And Brian's gonna dive into that to look at the arc of scripture and how it touches on things that we're dealing with today of addiction, of sexuality, of justice, of culture, of all these things and it is still relevant for us today. And if you're sitting there going, yeah, right, I don't think so, will you just prove me wrong and show up on Thursday? Like, come, I, just, just come. And if you're still like, don't buy it, that's fine. We'll have a cup of coffee, we'll have a drink, we'll talk about it, I'd love to hear from you. But like, if you think that I'm, I, I'm full of it, on like, just come on Thursday night. Just come sit here. I think the more that we spend time with God, the more we develop a healthy fear of the Lord. I know that personally, I choose wisdom way more often when I'm spending time with God. I just, I, I want, my, my hope for us as a community is that we get to the point that when we are facing a decision between foolishness and wisdom, we say, God, I need you, and God, I need this answer to come from you, because if it comes from me, I'm going to mess it up. Like, I, I need this to come from you, God. Second question I think we should look at when making these decisions, when we hear these constant sales pitches for the house of wisdom and the house of folly in our day is this, does it cost your integrity? Does it cost your integrity? Wisdom will never cost you your integrity. It just won't. Folly costs you your integrity. That's actually its sales pitch. It's like get rid of integrity for just a little bit and you'll get all the way further down. During our Ash Wednesday experience here as we kicked off the season of Lent a few months ago, we had stations around the room and one of the stations was a spot where we asked people to really sit and consider their own mortality. 
barring Jesus coming back in our lifetimes, like all of us will have a moment where we are gone and there are people who say things about us at our funeral memorial service and there are things written about us in an obituary. Like that's just the way life works. As we said on Ash Wednesday, right? Like ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I know I've told this story from the stage. I'm gonna keep repeatedly telling this from the stage because I think it matters and it matters so much to me and how much I frame my life and I'm hopeful that there are other people who find this helpful. One of the most formational moments in my life was when I sat at a memorial service of a relative of a youth student that I was working with. And the person that passed away, passed away at, at, of old age at the end of their life, and they had an incredibly successful life by any earthly standard. They had a loving family, they were well off, they gave a ton to charity, they, they were successful, they had all the things. The really cool thing is this, is at that memorial service, person after person, whether they follow Jesus or not, talked only about how they saw Jesus in this person. None of the earthly accomplishments got brought up. None of that mattered. I remember sitting there as a young parent listening to that memorial and going, that's what I want my memorial to sound like. And I actually believe this, that all of us, whether it's conscious or subconscious, have an idea of the type of person that we want to be. All of us have an idea of what and who we want to be known for and as when our time here on earth comes to an end. And I actually think this, that every decision we make either takes us closer to being that person or further away from being that person. Like, I think there's very few things that are really middle ground in life. Like, I think you know who you want to be and the decision either takes you closer to that or further from that. Now, there are some really minor things that probably don't move the needle too much, but I think that there are steps that we take in every decision. Wisdom will never take you further away from becoming that person you want to be known for. Just never will. Folly will, and it's going to do so sneakily. It says this, folly promises this, says, hey, just take a slight step back, take a slight step off the path towards being who you want to be, and I promise you, you're going to get to go five forward the next time. It says, hey, one step back, five step forward. There's a shortcut. It's okay. It's just, it's not true. There are no shortcuts. That doesn't pay off. It takes us to the last question that I think we should ask when, when looking at wisdom and folly is this, is does it sound too good to be true? Does it sound too good to be true? Here's the thing about life. There really isn't a get-rich-quick button or scheme. There's luck sometimes, right? I don't know how or why luck happens or chance or God's providence, whatever you want to call it. Like, I don't know why some people win the lottery and some people don't. I know why a lot of people don't, but, um, <laughs> but I don't know why the people who do get to. <laughs> right, but that's not, that's luck, and it's astronomical luck that you can never bank on. But here's the thing about folly is it is really captivating and alluring, isn't it? I daydream about winning the lottery like every two months. <laughs> I love planning. I love making decisions. I'm like, man, if I won that Mega Millions jackpot, like here's what I would do. We would do the lump sum, not the annuity. Here's what we would do. Here's what we would give. Of course, I'm going to give Jesus. Don't worry. Uh, right? Like all these things. And it's alluring, right? But here's, here's something to know. I've never played the lottery in my life. I daydream about it like every two months, but I've never done it because the rational side of my brain just can't get there <laughs> to actually buy a lottery ticket, but that doesn't stop me from daydreaming and fantasizing about it, right? Because that allure of a magic button, a magic ticket that changes everything and all of a sudden everything's going to be better because that's always what happens with lottery winners, right? Um, but that magic button, like, it just doesn't exist, but man, the idea of it is so captivating. Here's the thing. There is no get rich quick path. There is no business plan you can buy, ebook you can read, influencer digital course that you can subscribe to that will get you rich quickly. It does not exist. But that is Folly's biggest sales pitch. Oh yeah, just take a shortcut. It's gonna be totally fine. And it won't. But that's what Folly sells, right? We're gonna put the verses back up on the screen. Stolen water is sweet. Food in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there that our guests are deep in the realm of the dead. That's the sales pitch. You can steal things that aren't yours and it'll take just as sweet. Enjoy things in secret. It's actually better if you have it in secret. You just have to try it. Life does not work that way. Things done in solitude, in secret, in hiding alone, they corrupt our soul. They might bring happiness for a little bit, but they never bring true joy. 
In fact, they bring bitterness and corruption, and as we see in Proverbs, ultimately death. But we fall into this trap of folly all the time, right? This get-rich-quick trap, and it's not just with money. Sometimes it's tangentially related to money, where it's our jobs. Or it's like, hey, if I just cut these corners here, if I just do this on this project, if I just cut this person out, then I'm gonna get that promotion, and, and we're gonna be all set. It doesn't work that way. We do this in our romantic lives, culturally. We wanna get rich quick romantically in our, in our culture as well. We want the physical and emotional intimacy that comes from marriage, but we're not willing to put the time in. We're saying, man, monogamy sounds like a lot of work, and it is. It is. But we want those rewards in a hookup culture. We said, actually, I I want this, but I'm just going to do it this way. I'm I'm going to try to find it this way. I'm going to try to find that physical and emotional intimacy and fulfillment through hookups, and it doesn't work. Again, it might bring happiness for a little bit, but it doesn't bring true joy. Because you can't, you can't microwave real intimacy. It has to be slowly baked in over time. It hasn't stopped us from trying, right? I find myself sometimes trying to do this with parenting. Like, can I just skip this season of parenting and then everything's gonna be easy? Can I stop wiping butts for like <laughs> the rest of my life? Like other people's butts at least. Um, can, can we stop that for a season? Someone's going to try to sell me a bidet after this, and I, I just need you to know I'm not here for that pitch. But, um, but, right, we do that with, like, can we just skip to this season? Can we get out of the newborn phase that we were so excited to be in and then get into the taller phase? And we keep doing this, and it's so easy to keep trying to press fast forward as a parent that we miss the journey, right? Or sometimes our kid is really obnoxious in one area, which really is a sign that they're really needy in one area, And we say, if I just pretend that this isn't happening, then I can skip to the good parts of parenting. What we've done is we've just let the need go untouched and it's actually gonna come back and bite us. Because there are no shortcuts. The mundane parts of life is where we get to make these decisions that either take us closer to who we wanna be than, or further away from who we wanna be. We do this with life as a whole where we try to get rich quick. We're like, I want this kind of lifestyle. I want this kind of house or this kind of car or this many vacations or this kind of thing. And I'm gonna put it on the credit card and I'll deal with that layer because I deserve this. It comes back to bite us, doesn't it? Every single time. Wisdom never sells you on getting rich quick. It sells you on getting rich slowly, methodically. If someone is telling you something that sounds too good to be true, it is. Like if someone is selling you on something and it sounds too good to be true, it is. And again, I have friends who are in sales and and the people who are really good at sales, they don't do that. Like they're not the charlatans who are just burning through gullible people trying pitch after pitch after pitch with, hey, it sounds too good to be true, but maybe someone will bite. There are people who say, hey, yeah, we have a system, we have a plan and it's gonna take time, but if you put in time, you'll get results and you'll see what happens. If someone is selling you something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is. We're going to have Bannon and the community teams come forward now because we get to tie this in really, really well because, and this is what I love about doing this here, this is a church. This isn't a self-help seminar. This is a church. So that means we get to talk about something here which is really, really cool, which is this. There is something, there's one thing I believe that sounds too good to be true but actually is true. That's that message that Jesus brings that we call the gospel. Right, this idea that, that you and I, we were, we were made on purpose for a purpose and that God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it. And even though that we're all broken or we call him perfect, Jesus came to this broken place and he lived a perfect life. And the punishment that we deserve for our brokenness, Jesus took it upon himself. He says, I know all the awful things that these people have done are doing and will do in the future and I will take every aspect of that punishment on myself. That's what Jesus did. I need you to know that even though that sounds too good to be true, I promise you it's not. It is indeed true. We're gonna take communion in a little bit and communion's a time where we recognize this sacrifice that Jesus made where he took that punishment. He died on the cross for our brokenness. Three days later, we know he rose again from the dead and it gives us hope and new life. And communion is a time where we come forward and and you'll be given the cup and the bread. We remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. 
And as we get ready for that time, in a little bit I'll pray and then the band will lead us in a song. And during that song, you can come forward to communion or to these black walls for prayer. I want us to take a moment and prepare our hearts for that though. I think there's, there's probably two groups of people here that, that I'm really asking you to listen well and prepare your heart really well. And the first group is this, is that you're here today and that message of Jesus does sound too good to be true and you're just not there yet. I need you to know this one, I'm so glad you're here today. I don't know what brought you in here, whether it was chance, whether it was God, whether it was someone dragging you here, I'm glad you're here. So glad you're here today. Here's what I need you to know. That message is true. It's the only thing that sounds too good to be true, but actually is true. It's the only thing. I need you to just take a moment and, and have that conversation with God. Ask God in this room right now, have I done too much? Have I gone too far? Is there anything that you can't pull me back from? And I promise you the answer from God is going to be, there isn't, I love you, I'm here for you, and I died for that. So if that's you, I just would ask you to consider maybe having today be the first day that you say yes to that message of Jesus Christ and you come and take communion and celebrate that new life that you found by saying yes to that message. There's a second group though that I want to kind of sit and prepare your hearts on this and that's a group that kind of needs to rekindle that fear of the Lord. That we're here today and, and we've been relying on our own wisdom or maybe we've just been running into foolishness because we've forgotten the truth of who Jesus is and what he brings. And maybe today is a moment where for you, you're gonna re-up in your belief of that truth. You're gonna re-up on believing in who Jesus is and that fear of the Lord that comes with it. So now I'm gonna pray for us and I'm gonna pray for, for those two groups of people. And again, if you need prayer for anything, there are people at the front of the room who would love to pray with you. Would you guys pray with me this morning? God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for Jesus who came to this broken place and lived a perfect life and took every bit of punishment that we deserve onto himself, God. I thank you for that sacrifice. I thank you for the new life that we have in that, God. I thank you for the new wisdom that we have in that truth. God, our, our prayer as a community is this, is that we be a community known for wisdom that comes from you and only you, God. May we continue to lift Jesus and the truth that he brings higher than anything else here. May we be known as people in a community of integrity, God. May we be people who make decisions that bring us closer to who we want to be known for and as when things are all said and done. And God, we thank you in advance for the moments where we will make mistakes, where I will make mistakes, where people here will make mistakes, that you say that Jesus has already paid for that. God, may we never lose sight of how precious that gift is, how precious that sacrifice is. So God, I pray for those who are gonna say yes to you for the first time or say yes to you in a renewed way for the first time in a while today, God. May they feel your presence and your peace today as they make those decisions. In your name, amen.